Thank you very much to all of you for coming today. I'm recognizing some uh, very familiar faces here, so uh, I can only think of one other person who assured me that um, they were going to be here, but uh, I'm guessing that she's on her way. Uh, and I don't want to take up too much of our time, so uh, welcome. Uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Frank Traumler of the University of Pennsylvania here to the University of Iowa. And most of you know, I think, that Professor Traumler's uh, talk today is kind of a kickoff event or a pre-symposium event for our symposium that officially starts tomorrow on German immigration to Iowa, called German Iowa and the Global Midwest. I'll just go into my introduction here, and then we'll turn things over to Professor Traumler. Professor Frank Traumler of the University of Pennsylvania is one of the leading cultural historians of Germany and its relationship to the United States. Following studies in Berlin, Vienna, and Munich, he taught as a visiting lecturer at Harvard University before beginning a long and distinguished career at Penn, now in its 46th year. He is the author of several books, most recently, Kulturmacht ohne Kompass, uh, in 2014, and the full title of that book in English is Cultural Power Without a Compass, German Cultural Relations Abroad in the 20th Century. Professor Trommler has been particularly successful as an editor of over 10 seminal volumes of scholarship, recognizing timely issues and recruiting leading experts to address them, ranging from German literature's zero hour of 1945 to the status of Germanistic German studies in the United States. He has also played a guiding role in several major US-based institutions for German studies, um, serving terms as president of the German Studies Association, as well as uh, president of his local chapter of the American Association of Teachers of German. And did I see correctly, you have a really sort of Philadelphia, New Jersey-based chapter? OK. There's, there's plenty to do in Philadelphia, I have no doubt about it. Uh, he has also directed the Humanities Program at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies from 1995 to 2003. In 2004, he received twofold recognition for his lifetime of service to the profession. He was awarded the Order of Merit, the Bundesverdienstkreuz of the Federal Republic of Germany, and he was also honored with his own Festschrift. And for students in the audience, a Festschrift is what you get on the occasion of your retirement. All your students and colleagues and friends uh, contribute an essay, uh, and in this case, I believe it was two volumes of essays. I, I, am I remembering that correctly? Just, well, a, I'm sure a, 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 a good, hefty volume. Uh, the Festschrift was titled, The Many Faces of Germany, Transformations in the Study of German Culture and History, edited by John A. McCarthy, Thomas Kobna, and Walter Grunzweig, who is taught here on campus as a guest professor and welcomes young Iowans to Germany every year as part of the University of Iowa's exchange with the Universität Dortmund. Professor Traumler's longstanding work on German-American relations began in 1983 when he organized the Tricentennial Conference on German-American History, Politics, and Culture, which marked the 300th anniversary of the founding of Germantown, Pennsylvania, the first planned German colony in the United States. And on a little note, it just so happens that the historic founding of Germantown now serves as the occasion of German American Day, which is celebrated annually on October 6th. That means that tomorrow marks the 333rd anniversary of the founding of Germantown. That conference resulted in a two-volume collection of essays entitled America and the Germans, an assessment of a 300-year history, which remains a standard work in the field. His publications on the many faces of German America have continued to pace, but his interest in German American history is not merely academic. From 1994 to 1999, he co-chaired the Library Renovation Project of the German Society of Pennsylvania, which cataloged and restored the 70,000 volumes of the largest private German American collection in the United States. We are grateful to Professor Traumler for agreeing to contribute his expertise to our symposium on German Iowa and the global Midwest over the coming days, particularly since, from the Pennsylvania perspective, Iowa is a relative latecomer in the centuries-old story of German immigration to the US. The German Society of Pennsylvania was founded in 1764, 82 years before Iowa became a state and 95 years before Iowa City's own Deutsche Unterstützungsverein, the German Aid Society, was founded here in 1859. 
Tomorrow at 4.30 p.m., Professor Trommler will deliver the keynote address for our symposium in the Senate chamber of the Old Capitol, and you are all very welcome to attend. The topic of his talk then will be ethnic history, transnational history, illuminating the quandary of German Americans in the period of World War I. And I'll note, I'm going to have some programs for the uh, symposium here on the, uh, the shelf. Uh, you're welcome to grab some on your way out. Today, he will present on a topic related to his most recent work on German cultural diplomacy, something that I'm hoping the many students here from Germany and the world will find quite relevant for our current discussion of German politics. The talk title is Cultural Diplomacy and Military Aggression in the Third Reich. Please join me in welcoming Professor Traumler to the University of Iowa. <clears throat> Thank you, Glenn, for the invitation. I'm honored, and I'm delighted to be here. And Glenn has uh, pointed out that, uh, on the one hand, I'm a cultural historian of modern Germany, coming from literature, from uh, publications on Thomas Mann and Günter Grass and other. But I'm also, uh, by, hmm, yeah, by happenstance, more or less, in Philadelphia, in the place where German immigration, the organized German immigration started, and uh, out of which came the rescue of this uh, German library of the German Society of Pennsylvania. So I have this approach, on the one hand, from afar towards Germany as a cultural historian, reading German texts. On the, one, on the other hand, on the close and closeness, when I'm in Philadelphia and see that there is still this building, the old building of the German society uh, from 1888, and uh, with this wonderful library that was not cataloged. So it was a great treasure, but it wasn't cataloged. And uh, in the 1990s, I could raise funds, and uh, now it is accessible after it has been cataloged uh, to scholars uh, who come in the summer and um, actually can work uh, extensively about German-American history. So uh, there is a band from uh, Philadelphia also to Iowa, and this, uh, the, uh, what I heard about Iowa in the 1850s when it started to be a state, and uh, it was at the time when the mass immigration to Iowa uh, started. So uh, it is really a, a pertinent uh, topic uh, if you think of the German connection of Americans. Now today, I'm uh, very, I'm delighted to add to the, to Glenn Ernstein's um, course, Germany and the World, with a look at cultural diplomacy. And uh, I have um, called it cultural diplomacy and military aggression uh, in the Third Reich. Um, I want to juxtapose this somewhat, but I want to tell you about the way that Germans uh, presented themselves uh, to the world, which is part of the title, Germany in the world, or German <coughs> Germany in the world, but I uh, put the emphasis on culture. And there is something I want to make clear what cultural diplomacy means, and then I will go, and that would be in the first, I give a short introduction into this, and uh, then I will uh, place uh, the cultural diplomacy of the Third Reich under Hitler in this context. The context is international, and the founding, or let's say the conceptualization of the word cultural diplomacy is where else could it be in France? After France uh, suffered a de decisive defeat uh, from the Prussian German army in 1871, they brought out the idea of making a stance in the world through culture, not just through colonies, which, was, which were um, uh, more or less uh, acquired in the 1870s and 80s, but also through culture. And the French word uh, was diplomatie culturelle, and the German word uh, is auswärtige Kulturpolitik, so foreign cultural policy or politics. And the French in the 1880s uh, found it something that is still existing and is still a mark, uh, a, a really a remarkable um, um, 
monument to, to their cultural policy abroad. You, uh, many of you know the Alliance Francaise. It was founded in 1883. It was a way of re-established, re-established France as a sort of cultural world power after its defeat um, uh, to, to Germany. And uh, the founding of the Alliance Francaise 1883 was a very important uh, moment. There were other nations uh, who thought that is a way uh, teaching uh, French language and culture and having mutual societies of interest in other countries. So it is not just French presenting itself or French uh, people presenting themselves, but also having the input of the other. That was a very clever, still existing, uh, still uh, viable uh, concept that has been used also in the 20th century. The the interesting uh, thing is there were other states I mentioned, not Germany, um, because it was not really a unified culture at that, at that time. Uh, it was certainly the German Kaiserreich, the, the imperial uh, the empire under uh, Wilhelm, but it was uh, also, you could say, that the Austrian-Hungarian monarchy was at that, in those years, in the 1880s, also a German state, certainly with other ethnic and national groups. But the state that, that actually used it after its unification was Italy. And uh, there was a society that was founded similarly in the 1880s and 1889, was called the Societa Dante Alighieri, and it, it brought together the, uh, the uh, Italians from abroad with the Italians in Italy. So that this function of cultural diplomacy or cultural uh, relations was always connected with, um, let's say, inhabitants or with uh, uh, people uh, of the same culture in foreign countries. You might know, or not know, <laughs> uh, I didn't, um, that among the immigration to the United States, yes, there's just the Irish, certainly the first, the British, the Irish, the Germans in the, 18, in the second half of the 19th century, but almost at least as many Italians immigrated, and so uh, it is really a factor of immigration. One should see um, this all in, in, in Italy. Um, the <clears throat> German Reich under Wilhelm II existed from um, 1871 to 1918. And at that time, uh, it didn't have an official cultural diplomacy. There were unofficial, non-governmental institutions uh, that dealt with German Wissenschaft, with German science, German uh, theater, German literature, and so on abroad, yes. But it was not official. It was not uh, sponsored by the state. It didn't, it didn't do it until 1920 when the Weimar Republic was founded, when also founded a, a cultural department and tried to present the Germany, in this case, the new Germany to the world, uh, modern Germany to the world, through exhibitions, through a cultural exchange, and so on. And uh, that is what um, the, more or less the, uh, prehistory of uh, what I'm going to say today. I would also add to one, uh, one aspect <clears throat> that um, after the First World War, or in the, I should say, in the First World War, it was not just that nations ran against each other, fought each other on the military field, but they also fought each other on the cultural field. And there was in any of the four powers that uh, more or less were involved in First World War, Germany, Great Britain, France, and Russia, there was a, a rush to a, a cultural representation and mobilization in 1914-15. And uh, that is a typical effect, typical effect of a war that brings together uh, people and under what um, let's say, uh, title or under what uh, notion, it is culture, the British culture, the French culture, the German culture, the Russian culture. This was an enormous boost for nationalization of cultural uh, politics. And World War I became, to some extent, um, the initiator 
of uh, the cultural uh, policies of the 1930s. In the 1920s, when the war ended and people felt that this um, battle and uh, slaughter of uh, nations, of young men of these nations, really uh, had been a terrible mistake, they had the tendency to, um, uh, to prefer international ways of communicating. So the first, the League of Nations was founded, the um, uh, American institutions of um, the Rockefeller Foundation and Carnegie and, um, were uh, active in Europe, and they tried uh, to have a sort of internationalization of cultural relations, while this, with the big depression in 1930, 31, 32, really, um, <clears throat> was fading in a new nationalism in most of these countries. And when I said I would uh, say some words about cultural diplomacy in general and then go to the particular uh, situation of, of Germany in the 1930s under Hitler, it is about uh, the uh, effect that <clears throat> the uh, increasing uh, tension in Europe had on cultural representation that it became more national, more nationalistic, and in some ways uh, really more organized. And <clears throat> it goes just through to, be, to do it fast. Italy had a head start with whom? With a great dictator, Mussolini, who was a great cultural politician. And I have to say, I was amazed when I go into, went into the archive in Berlin and looked up what, where Goebbels got his ideas uh, for the cultural uh, propaganda in Germany. The first thing that he did in the summer of 1933, he went to Rome and uh, questioned Mussolini what kind of programs they did. It was a it's a fascinating part. So Mussolini, but also Great Britain, did uh, sum up its, its, its force, its cultural force with language, and founded the British Council, which still exists as the cultural um, representation of uh, Great Britain in the world, British Council founded in 1935. The French certainly had um, their, let's say, ministerial, their governmental um, established um, form of, uh, culture, uh, of diplomatie culturelle and increased it in the 1930s. Um, there was also an enormous power in the East, Russia, then Soviet Union, where there is a fascinating part of Soviet Union. Um, at that time, the communist uh, power uh, set in the 1920s strongly on internationalism. But under Stalin in the 1930s, a lot of communist propaganda went into national orientation. Stalin spoke of socialism in one country. And the, uh, the founding documents are with the Socialist Realism Conference in Moscow in 1934. So you see an increasing nationalization and um, that is something that um, could even be seen in the uh, uh, politics of Japan at that time. Japan uh, preparing its uh, invasion of the Manchuria in China um, in the later 1930s, prepared it with a big cultural offense, uh, offensive and uh, also using national and cultural means. And um, even the United States at that time, though not eager to have any government representation abroad, aside from Rockefeller and Carnegie as private institutions, founded a um, division of uh, cultural relations in the State Department in 1938. And so since then, later it became uh, USIA, the, the uh, agencies have, have changed their names in Washington, and certainly it was part of the Cold War. And I will come back to this in, in, a, in, a, in a bit. Um, what did Hitler, Goebbels, the leaders of the Third Reich, try to present to the world?
They were very interested in culture, just not the culture that the modern establishment in Berlin was pursuing, with many Jews among them. And the initial effect of the cultural policies in the Third Reich are a sort of repeat of the mobilization with col national mobilization with culture in the First World War. Hitler and, and others referred very often to the way that a, a country, that a people come together under the, the uh, auspices of Goethe and Schiller, of Bach and Beethoven, and all these national uh, heroes in culture. And um, we know that Hitler was a failed painter and uh, that has been, <clears throat> uh, had his negative consequences. He was very interested in architecture. And so that from the beginning, I would, I have to announce this or pronounce this. In the beginning, um, that was part of the, um, let's say, representation. However, with the uh, boycott of Jewish business, of Jewish uh, literature, of, of Jews in general, in 1933 and later years, this was a very fragile thing abroad. You could mobilize people within Germany through propaganda, through, but abroad was another uh, story. And this is why it is uh, not easy to understand, but it is a fact that Hitler was very careful in the presentation of the Third Reich, or National Socialist Germany, abroad. With, while the mobilization of culture within the country, under the guise of, of Goebbels as a propaganda minister and so on, was very active. Outside, Hitler left it to the Foreign Service. They had established an, an independent organization, which still exists, by the way. It's an interesting thing of the German, um, let's say, uh, structuring of uh, cultural policies. It is the German Academic Exchange Service, DAAD, that still exists and is a very fine, uh, great sponsor of a lot of exchange of students uh, going to Germany and uh, scientists. This DAAD was a relatively independent organization founded in the Weimar Republic, uh, certainly not to, for, for the purpose of propagating uh, dictatorship, but it was there, it was in Berlin, it was under the guise not of Goebbels and not of the Foreign Service, but of the Interior Ministry and the Education Ministry. So the DAD as a place had this, uh, some branches in London and Paris and some other, had, uh, was doing um, uh, student exchanges and so on, and could exist more or less until 1937 without too much interference. And so you see um, <clears throat> that the um, cultural policy abroad is something different from cultural policies within the country. And um, that is, um, I think, a point when I um, come up with this title, uh, Cultural Diplomacy and uh, Military Aggression. Um, on the one hand, Hitler wanted to present Germany as a strong power. In some ways, not yet in the beginning, but later as a military power, but as a strong power. And at the same time, he wanted to present the country as a sort of cultural power uh, based on the tradition of German culture that I mentioned in music in literature, in, in uh, theater, in uh, architecture, and so on. And this is in the background of enormous uh, investment of um, uh, the uh, uh, the government or the party, yeah, the government in this case, in, in, in cultural policy, um, up to the end of the Second World War. It might strike you <clears throat> as a strange assessment of the Nazi state that is seen as a perpetrator against modern art, free art, and so on. We know that. We say Nazi was, was against modern art. Yes, but one can only understand the weight that the Nazis uh, attributed to culture if one understands uh, their, their, uh, their 
interest in culture itself, but not in the culture that was presented in the modern movement. And uh, to some extent, it, it uh, accounts for a lot of shady um, historical things. For instance, the Bauhaus, yes, it was a founding of the Weimar Republic. It represented a new mass-oriented democracy. But at the same time, Gropius didn't emigrate until 1935. He wanted to have uh, also assignments. Mies van der Rohe didn't, uh, didn't emigrate until 1936. So there were many elements. I just don't want to go too deeply into this. I just want to say that a lot more is shady. <laughs> it's a, in, a, in a twilight zone. And then certainly we, we know the main attack of the Nazi cultural policy was against Jews. And whatever he has um, uh, his interest uh, was very strongly against um, uh, the Jewish part of German culture, which is a definite part, has been since the 18th century. Jews have contributed fully to the emergence of German culture. In this case, it's uh, the, the great light was uh, got a, a blessing in the 18th century, and it was always a part of it. And uh, his anti-Semitism, Hitler's anti-Semitism, has uh, <coughs> struck the, against this. And um, we have now the big problem uh, for uh, the dictator and for the national socialism. Hitler's ranting against Jews is a race, racism, full-blown racism. If you, as a country, build your understanding of culture on the Aryan race, on the German race, how can you export this? Big problem. I mean, that is, that is um, a, a contradiction. And so that was the real... <laughs> quandary of uh, uh, cultural politicians in the 1930s in Germany. On the one hand, Hitler, yes, he has his, his racial um, uh, ranting on, in these party congresses and so on about uh, Jews. He refers to Wagner and to a lot of uh, whatever, uh, uh, Turkish um, authors. And, uh, but how can you present German culture in France, in England, in whatever, in, in, um, in Mexico, or in, in the United States? So Hitler left it, most of it, in the foreign service under the Joachim Rippentrop, who was the foreign minister. And <clears throat> there is the uh, Department of Cultural Diplomacy that was even called Departure, uh, Department of Cultural Policies of 1936. So uh, there is clearly uh, a sort of um, empowering um, of, uh, of cultural relations as part of foreign uh, uh, policies and indeed um, the, uh, I would say, the period after 1938 until 1944-45, during the war, is a, uh, is a period of military aggression, of persecution of the Holocaust. And at the same time also, based on what I have shown you, or as explained to you as a context, the uh, cultural, um, the, let's say, interest in the 1930s uh, based on cultural um, politics. And um, so that the Second World War, as a, as a war of occupation of other countries in Europe on the side, from the uh, side of Germany, is also, uh, uh, also became a war um, of uh, cultural institutions. And this is something not so easy <laughs> to swallow because we know, um, and rightly so, that the Holocaust, the persecution of Jews, um, has overshadowed most research of the Second World War. But the Second World War was also a fight of ideologies, certainly communism, fascism, um, and to some extent, I should say, separate national socialism. But um, the, um, the Second World War uh, 
brought out a um, occupation policy uh, in countries in the West, in Western Europe, that could not base, be based on propaganda alone. So Germany had to show itself as a cultural power with theater and um, high, what we called high culture. And so, which happened after 39. However, it did not happen in Eastern Europe. And if I <clears throat> say that Hitler was playing with these things, on the one hand, he was uh, pursuing his race agenda. On the other hand, he was very careful uh, to leave cultural, foreign cultural policy in the hands of the foreign, um, foreign uh, service. He played, for instance, a very surprising um, event is that in 1934, he turned around, turned around the aggression against, more or less, the aggressive view against Poland. And in the Weimar Republic, Poland, that had gained from the uh, Versailles Treaty, gained in, 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 in lands and also in German population. In the Weimar Republic, so Poland, more or less, as a sort of um, the adversary. Hitler turned around in 1934 for his politics between Western powers and Russia. He wanted to woo Poland away from the alliance with France and Czechoslovakia into an alliance with Germany against Russia. And all of a sudden, in 1934, he starts a cultural off uh, offensive, I should say, um, with exhibitions, with concerts in Poland. And between 1934 and 1938, there is a sort of uh, open uh, uh, cultural policies that, for instance, the foreign ministry, and you know diplomats are very slow to learn, the foreign ministry, they hated it. They were not convinced that this one could all of a sudden become a very good um, uh, policy towards the former adversary. For instance, in 1935, there was a great Polish, uh, great exhibition of Polish paintings in Berlin, 1935. Hitler was a great uh, admirer of Józef Pilsudski, who had a sort of semi-dictatorial uh, position in Poland, unfortunately, died in 1935, shortly afterwards, and Józef Beck, the foreign minister. Hitler attended this exhibition in Berlin. He even took off his military uh, uniform <laughs> and uh, appeared in a, in a, in a tuxedo. He made sort of, he wooed them and made this uh, feeling, gave the Poles, at least the official Poland, the feeling, yes, uh, he, is, he makes an overture and we should consider what is going on. This is how far cultural diplomacy reached. But we know in 1939, I had already come to this moment when he decided uh, to uh, attack Poland, he totally, reversed this um, policy. A terrible reversal, harsh, brutal, inhuman, from celebrating Polish culture, it went to uh, conscious destruction of Polish culture. And uh, it was a terrible politics, eliminating the Polish intelligentsia, closing the universities, destroying cultural monuments, ransacking the libraries. Only Krakow uh, remained undestroyed, the seat of the German pre-consul, proconsul Hans Frank. Similar terrible policies were used against the Soviet Union two years later in 1941 when Hitler attacked the Soviet Union, and uh, also with harsh attacks against Russian culture and labeling of uh, 
Russians as subhuman, where the racist agenda came out. And this is the point. In Eastern Europe, he applied his racist agenda. He applied it, as we know, in most terrible form in the Holocaust, which is part of the uh, attack on Eastern Europe, where Jews were living in Poland, in, so in the Soviet Union. And so uh, this is the, uh, let's say, dark side of this, especially in the light of the overtures of the 1930s. The picture is quite different in the West, in Western Europe. Hitler waited until the spring of 1940 to attack France. And then he overran with his tanks the French army. Very surprisingly, all people thought that this would be more resistance. French fled Paris was a big turmoil in the summer of 1940. However, Hitler thought French culture is a high achievement, is something that we admire, although we fight uh, the military. And so he turns around and guarantees France an independent state, <laughs> independent from occupation, while he keeps Paris and the rest of the country under German occupation. So we have this strange situation between 1940 and 1944, at least in 1942, that Hitler occupies with the German army, he occupies France, and allows a lot of cultural blossoming in Paris and in France, because he wants the French to collaborate. And Pétain, Marshal Pétain, who was the figurehead of the Vichy, of this independent France, in 1940 to 1942 or later, Marshal Pétain, yes, he collaborates because he thinks he can save part of France in a conservative manner against the former republic, and Hitler has more or less Paris as the place where most French intellectuals, except for the Jewish intellectuals, live and work, at least what the censorship and what people uh, and the uh, command of the cultural department in the embassy allow. So I don't want to go too far in either direction, but I want to say that's fascinating. It was always for me, being a student of French film and French literature, that many of these ex excellent, interesting uh, French uh, existentialist treatises and books and films come from the early 1940s. The theater, the French theater, there is French, French, one French um, historian of theater who said that in 1941, 42, it was the high point of uh, Paris uh, theater because in some ways theater was not censored. It was a place where a performance, French performance of French ideas could take place in Paris. So these things happen. You see the, the, the differentiation and uh, writers like Jean-Paul Sartre and um, André Gide and others lived in this uh, occupied part of France. And uh, certainly one has to say that um, a lot of French were deported as forced labor to Germany, were prisoners of war in Germany. However, Hitler was trying to at least get the uh, collaboration of the French economy in support of his, uh, of his military goals. This, to some extent, did actually happen. And I don't go into the collaboration of the, of the French, uh, let's say, middle classes and upper middle classes. I just want to say this is to be seen in the back of, uh, uh, of uh, a cultural wooing, cultural policies, one can do something, and so on. Anyway, I haven't talked much about propaganda. <laughs> and you were wondering, uh, I mentioned Goebbels in the beginning, how does this 
jibe with, with uh, the cultural diplomacy, with propaganda. And it's an interesting fact that Goebbels himself made a distinction. He said, and he wasn't really sure, although his ministry was called propaganda ministry, in his, in his even not just his uh, diaries, but also in his public exp expression, he said propaganda is not very positive. It is seen since World War I as a, um, a detriment to uh, the truth and so on. However, he used it, and he used it well, and what his secret was to mix it with entertainment. He was a great sponsor of film. He was a great sponsor of a lot of propaganda material in, let's say, cultural form. And uh, Goebbels himself said, propaganda is for the day. It has to establish our dominance. However, we want something that will last. You might have heard of the word, the Thousand Year Reich, <laughs> the, um, for the uh, National Socialist uh, Germany. They wanted to something that lasts. And so also Goebbels was very interested in, <clears throat> in uh, preserving culture and presenting culture. And um, this is where um, the paradox becomes uh, clear. Um, that uh, Germany, not just in France, but also in the Netherlands and Norway and Denmark and in other occupied countries, presented itself as a cultural power. And then there were countries in Europe, for instance, Slovakia, um, Hungary, and some other countries, Bulgaria, Romania, where the um, Foreign Service said, we have to have cultural diplomacy in order to woo the elites of these countries. So there's another part of collaboration, a little bit like in France, however, in these countries, um, uh, stronger. And that is the background of uh, Ribbentrop, he was the foreign minister, in 1940 to actually win a fight with Goebbels when you win a fight in, in National Socialist Germany, it's usually that you can uh, bring P Hitler to your side, on your side. At this very moment, Rebentrop was able to say, let us do the foreign um, cultural policy, and you do the propaganda in Germany, more or less. And uh, Rebentrop succeeded, at least got a lot of money. And what they did was, accompanying this military um, occupation of half of Europe, most of Europe, um, with a cultural initiative where the German traditional culture of Bach and Beethoven, but also Wissenschaft, the scientific culture, were um, presented. And they founded institutes in 1940 that were called Deutsche Wissenschaftliche Institute, German Scientific Institutes. And they did this with a big program in several of the countries, in even many cities in Europe, where people could learn German. And they had about a thousand lecturers, lecturers of German in, in the cities from Lisbon to Athens uh, to Oslo. And they did this in many cities. And uh, I just mentioned this because when I read, well, when I did my research some uh, almost 10 years ago, when I started, I couldn't believe that there were institutes um, in Paris, in Budapest, Cultural Institute, Budapest, Copenhagen, Madrid, Sofia, Belgrade, Athens, Brussels, Helsinki, Zagreb, Bratislava, Lisbon, Tirana, Venice, and Stockholm. They are in some ways precursors of the Goethe Institutes, the present day German cultural institutes in uh, many cities in the world. And these institutes were kept with money, were kept with monies and the institutes had a, a prominent scholar as a, as a director and 
the weight of this was so strong that even in 1944, when people knew that Germany would lose the war, they still founded an institute, cultural institute, in Milan, in Italy. So it shows there is something about uh, this presence. And um, I will finish with, with a paragraph that I've read, been written before. Enormous investment exemplified in the fact that even as late as 1944, they still pursued this uh, policy. At the times of sagging military fortunes, one wanted to show how untouched German dominance was by demonstrating the greatness of its culture and Wissenschaft, science. This is the final distortion of German culture under the Nazis. It had to cover up the military defeat. This is, uh, I have to, I was told that I should stop at 15. It's now 17. <laughs> and maybe we start with a question and answer. Is that okay? Um, that's fine. We, I just turned on the microphone to take questions and discovered that the battery is apparently almost out. Oh so, uh, Mae Clark, the, the, our assistant here, she's going to swap out the microphone. Um, but I don't think we have to absolutely have the microphone. We are taking this for those of you. Who if you speak right. loudly, yeah. yeah. So if you, sure. if you speak up, we should be able Please. to get your yeah. question here. And let's just open the floor. Uh, any questions here? John. Yes, uh, one of the surprising things for me check, check. is uh, when Hitler came to visit Paris after the fall of France. The first place he wanted to go was the Opera. And of course, there are the famous photographs of the opera decked out with swastika flags. And I wondered if you could comment a little bit more about Hitler's interest in opera and in Wagner in particular, and how that was perhaps a means of cultural diplomacy. In short, yes. You point out to his love for Wagner. And I see Hitler's connection with Wagner, especially in the, in the place, not just that he liked Wagner's music and so on and so on, that's his taste, but that he took Wagner as a sort of prophet of a culture that would be new, that would be a, a, a new uh, encompassing culture and a new, uh, let's say, um, common cause for a whole country. Wagner's idea of Bayreuth, of the uh, Festspiele in, in Bayreuth, this, this, uh, this place, was always to have a community come together, which is, in his way, uh, Volk and Hitler uh, very much followed this lead. So Wagner plays an important role as giving him ideas uh, for the mobilization of, of, of the people uh, through culture, in this case, music. And as you know, music played, maybe not today so much anymore, but played an enormous, a crucial role uh, for, for Germans and also giving them an identity from Bach and Beethoven and Wagner. Next question, please. Uh, Thank you very much. I uh, think I have a slightly different perspective of the, how devious the plan of Hitler really was in the time of the 30s. So if you really look at it, one of the problems he had to face was that because of the lost First World War, he was forced not to have a large army and he had to build it up. At the same time, he needed to uh, rope in his people to really applaud him for what he could accomplish. So if you look at this from a perspective of when he annexed first Austria, and then without a war annex Czechoslovakia, then you get a very different perspective of why he played a very different card initially with Poland. Because during that time, he needed to fix all his plans with Russia to separate Poland before he could invade it. Is that not part of how you read this or how do you interpret all of that? I wouldn't agree with all of what you said about uh, Czechoslovakia was certainly under the threat of military. Uh, Czechoslovakia certainly was, was under the threat of, of military and Austria also was more or less threatened. Um, in this case, um, a combination uh, should be seen, but um, for Germans, 
the effect of national socialist cultural policies uh, was to some extent following uh, the situation of World War I, when, to, when indeed the country felt united uh, under the guise of, of, of German culture, and Hitler tried to repeat this. It is very clear that Goebbels had a very clear agenda. So it is under military, under a military umbrella, putting culture to work, and to some extent this disguise uh, military uh, aggressiveness. And on the other hand, certainly giving people in, in uh, Munich and in Berlin and in Hamburg uh, a great time because writers, certain writers, not Jewish writers, felt all of a sudden they could, they could, they could be in the public, they would be supported. And uh, so um, this is the differentiated view uh, of someone like me living, whatever, 70 years after the fact. I just want to bring this out that I would differentiate um, the feeling within Germany and outside of Germany. Yeah, next question, please. Yep. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Thomas Mann at the uh, beginning of the lecture, and I know that he um, uh, was very active in uh, anti-Nazi um, uh, support. So I'm just wondering, um, uh, on the subject of literature, how many authors, German authors, um, sort of um, were against the Nazis and how many um, were with them and sort of took advantage of the uh, um, Nazi culture? Great question. And you really poked the <laughs> into, uh, uh, let's say, something that I left out uh, because of time, that it was a very strong uh, community of exile writers, and Thomas Mann first reluctantly, but later in 1936 joined them and was became the spokesperson for this uh, for the exile writers. It is also, if I can change this, uh, this would expand it a little bit. Exiled writers, many, Anna Segers and Leon Feuchtwanger and Heinrich Mann and Thomas Mann and um, many others. Exiled writers kept alive abroad the idea of a free human German literary culture. And Thomas Mann can be credited for having articulated this and many others too. And the obsession of the regime, in many ways Goebbels himself and others, with the exiled writers as taking them uh, to task, only shows also how much, how seriously they took cultural effects, cultural, um, let's say, aggression, cultural um, responsibilities that the that uh, Thomas Mann showed, and. This is something that um, should be seen um, that um, opposition to the Third Reich through culture, through literature, was something that um, could build through, let's say, these writers, some composers and others, and architects later, However, it, it was very difficult because the Third Reich had all the means of propaganda, of radio, and of, of, of even foreign countries like Britain were sometimes reluctant to just um, let exiled writers um, dominate the discourse with Germany. But the exiled writers are really the ones who kept, uh, for us, who will have lived later, um, sort of the feeling alive, kept it alive, that there was not just everything given over to the Nazis, but they kept this. And when they came back uh, after the Second World War, not many Germans were, were happy with this because they thought they had been tra traitors to, to the German cause. Anyway, it's a long discussion, but I'm grateful and maybe picked up a little bit. I think we have time for two more questions. 
Assuming there are two more questions. <laughs> Michaela. I have two more questions, but we'll count them as one in case there is, you know, someone else. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. I, I wanted to build on the last question, and I was wondering if in your research you came across um, evidence that the cultural, the Nazi cultural offensive uh, included this country, that there was a particular program to highlight cultural achievements, German cultural achievements in the United States and what that looked like. And my second question, which can be deleted in favor of another one is, um, if in your research you came across um, striking examples how the Nazi German cultural offensive was um, received um, across Europe, maybe in the West different than in, than in Eastern Europe. I think you began talking a little bit yeah. about this, uh, and it's really interesting, you know, collaboration I think is a really interesting and nuanced field. Okay. Thanks for this question. Um, <clears throat> since I mentioned Thomas Mann, I will stick to this, at least it's a name that you are familiar or can be familiar with. Thomas Mann, in 1941, two, three, became the spokesperson of um, German exile, more or less in the West. There was only Britain that was left and uh, United States. And Thomas Mann became a sort of the personal stalwart of a stance against fascism, against Hitler. He had um, great mass meetings, even up to 800 people in, in, uh, in New York and in, um, in, in Chicago, in some places. So um, once the resistance against Hitler was personalized in this writer, and then people could catch on. And they, they, they felt that Thomas Mann, um, sort of, who had first been in his life a conservative, but switched to democracy, uh, was a good spokesperson of a, a humanistic and democratic Germany. And um, the second uh, question. But, Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. There's also a, a big chapter that um, one has to see the 1930s as, a, as a, a decade of great turmoil, angst, and uh, reassurance in national and ethnic um, traditions. And many countries in Germany and in, in Europe uh, follow to some extent the national socialist idea of conservative, listen, and of going back to the Turkish roots of, of their um, uh, country. And uh, as for instance, even Vichy France, um, the, what Pétain brought up was uh, famille, patrie, and Whatever. It's not liberté and égalité and fraternity. It was a very conservative um, uh, agenda. And so one I could build on this and could say, Goebbels, whatever, little triumph for us that in 1941, he uh, brought uh, European writers from Finland, Slovakia, Italy, France, and so on to Weimar in a, in a meeting of, of writers whom we would nowadays uh, label as conservative, not necessarily folkish, but conservative. And so to reestablish the regions, the conservative agenda of the family, of the uh, of home, of Heimat, and so on, this is something that is not totally unfamiliar nowadays, and one has to see it as a, as a reaction. And for this, um, one has to, if you bring this up, what the reaction was. The reaction in general is against any occupation, and the German occupation was worse than any other. I would say that um, at least many people collaborated because they wanted to go after their daily routine. And, um, and this is something um, that, that, that happened. If you think uh, it is also something that has to be formulated. Be between 1940 and 1944, 200 million Europeans more or less didn't have military action. Many men were deported and had to uh, work in, in, in German factories. However, many other people were living and wanted to be entertained. How were they entertained? 
by films that Goebbels propagated. And so uh, there is something that the, the uh, I don't want to, to talk too much about the, the acceptance of this occupation. As I said, occupation is terrible. However, the means are not so incredible as one would assume. There is one, maybe one, you had another? No? Anyone? Well, then we've, we've reached the end of our time. And for students in Germany and the world, this means you're actually getting out 10 minutes early. Um, no objections there, I assume. So please join me in thanking uh, Professor Frank Tromner for his talk today. Thank you.